The South African Broadcasting Corporation has issued a statement saying it is pleased with yesterday's order by the Labour Court of South Africa in the matter pertaining to Mrs. Palisa Chubisi and the SABC. The broadcaster says the Labour Court ruled in favour of its proposition for Ms. Chubisi not to return to her role as a producer presenter of the programme SA Today, which was an irregular appointment but rather to be reinstated to her previous position of producer presenter of Lissedi FM current affairs program. Of course, Chubisi's lawyer says a statement by the SABC is misleading and false in which the public broadcaster is trying to portray itself in a good light, it says. We join now by advocate William Curry. A very good evening to you. Thank you so much for speaking to us. What is the reason behind your sentiment? What is inaccurate about the statement? Uh, good evening, uh, ma'am. The, uh, the Labour Court, if you remember, on the 2nd of November, it uh, reinstated Palesa as an employee of the SABC, and it ordered to the SABC to pay the cost including the cost of two cancer. The SABC appealed against that order, because it maintained that uh, it dismissed Palisa lawfully. The filing of the leave to appeal suspend the order. So as a result of that, Palisa could not report for duty. She was required, as a matter of law, to go back to the Labour Court to ask the Labour Court to put the order into operation notwithstanding the leave to appeal by the SABC. And that matter was set down for the Friday of the 13th of November. The SABC capitulated again to that application, which it initially opposed. It capitulated by agreeing that Palisa should be reinstated. It then withdrew its leave to appeal, making the judgment of the 2nd of November, to be effective. And again, the SABC agreed to pay the cost of that execution application, including the cost of two cancer. The only thing that the SABC requested from us as the lawyers of Palesa and Palesa was that because of the High Court pending review application, which relates to the irregular appointment in presenter, producer, TV, morning life. Can she agree to temporarily occupy her original position okay. in the state? And in this case, I just want to get clarity. Are you referring here to the public protectors of findings which uh, you are um, asking to be put on review? Uh, to the review, that's right. You remember that uh, the public protector has made a finding against the SABC. It said the SABC has appointed Palisa irregularly in the position of presenter producer. Mm. Then the public protector said to the SABC, I'm giving you three options. The first one, you can confirm her in the current position that is presenter, producer, TV. The second one, you can put her anywhere else, but the position must be commensurate to the one that she occupies. The third option, you can take her back to her original position in the same. Okay. That I, I application want... is being taken on review. It is currently before the High Court and it is still to be determined. I want to understand something, the advocate Mkari. I want to find out why is a 2016 position in question when there was a new contract in 2018, was there not an appointment letter at 2018? In my mind, then saying that uh, the other one becomes obsolete. No, are the, 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 you talking about the 2018 which... Uh, put her in um, the SA today. Yes, so I, I want to understand, 
why is the issue of a 2016 appointment in question if there was another appointment or at least contract in 2018 does the one oh, no. yeah i understand what you're saying um the the 2018 um position which she currently occupy which is presenter producer um channel 404 it was a secondment it was not a new contract she is appointed in terms of the 2016 contract which is morning life then she was seconded from morning life to present channel 404 SA today so that is why then that one is not really the issue the SABC was simply using her in okay. channel 404 but the current by the position that she occupies in terms of the incoming contract is a 2016 so that is why it is a 2016 one which is the issue so the crux of the matter here, what you're saying is uh, uh, Ms. Chubisi going to her former position at Lisedi FM is as a result of an agreement between uh, you as her lawyers and the lawyers of the SABC, as in it is something that has been mutually agreed on. Are you saying, as the SABC saying, that it is not a court order? No. No. Um it is and also it is something that is agreed on temporarily it is a temporary measure whilst the review of the public protector is being ventilated in the high court in fact the court order which was made by agreement between the parties it has a clause and the SABC has a duty to produce to you as the presenter the court order the court order has a clause which is paragraph four would say that should Palisa succeed with her review application in the High Court, she will immediately occupy her current position of presenter, producer, morning life. And right. in that order, the SABC is ordered to pay the cost, including the cost of two cancer. And that is something that the SABC had a duty to have disclosed to the public. All right. Uh, thank you very much. That is uh, Advocate okay. Mkari on behalf of Ms. Palisa Chubisi. For response now, SABC Advocate Ntutuzelo Vanara joins us now. I'm not sure how much you heard of that, Mr. Vanara, but uh, Advocate Vanara, but what Advocate Mkari is saying is, firstly, this was not a court order that uh, Ms. Chubisi returned to her previous position. It's as a result of an agreement, a temporary agreement reached between uh, by the lawyers and uh, that the court order uh, actually really speaks to the cost that you have to pay and he believes that you have not played open cards with the public. What's your response? Yeah, look, uh, uh, thanks, Sabiso, uh, for having me. I have not had the opportunity to listen to the interview because I am not uh, in front of the mm. television set. Um, but um, based on what you are telling me, um, let me clarify one. The statement uh, that uh, the corporation issued is actually accurate. And that statement is based on a court order. Uh, that is to the effect that uh, the relevant uh, employee is uh, reinstated to a position at Lissedi in Bloemfontein. Anyone who says something contrary to that uh, is misleading the public. But how do you have two different interpretations of what the court order says? Advocate uh, Nkari says the court strictly says that she must be reinstated, that the fact that she is being reinstated to her opposition is something that uh, the lawyers drew up in agreement as a temporary measure. So it's got to be one or the other. What I have uh, in my possession, what the organization has in its possession, is a court order. And uh, this court order is as a result of a proposition that the SABC... Advocate Venara, we cannot hear you, please. <laughs> 
place your mouth next to the mouthpiece? Can you hear me now? That's much better. Thank you. Okay. So I'm saying the court order is as a result of a proposition that was made by the SABC on receipt of an unnecessary application that had drawn us to go to court. The SABC wrote to the employees, attorneys, to advise them that it was unnecessary for us to go to court because the SABC had made a proposal that the employee go back to her original position in Bloemfontein at Lefebvre where she was not... So the SABC the made the proposal. This was not as a result of a court order. Is that what you're now saying, Advocate Benara? Uh, I think it's imperative that you understand the context. The SABC made an offer which offer was rejected by the attorneys of the employee, which forced the SABC to honor the application the employee had brought resulting in the SABC going to court and in court an order which is in possession of both parties. I do not understand how can one party say there is no order when there is a court order to this effect. Okay, just for clarity, you are saying the SABC made the proposal to the applicant's lawyers that the applicant go back to her original position while the matter is before the High Court. Is that correct? That, that is correct. The court order was that Ms. Chubisi be reinstated. Is that correct? To her original position at the same time. But to my understanding, you abandoned your appeal to prevent her being reinstated. Reinstated to where? At the SABC. Unless you, you adopt a posture that suggests that the court order is not in existence. The court order is quite clear. This should be seen is reinstated to her position at the same effort. And I'm saying anyone who disputes the existence one of the court order and its contents is telling the public line. Okay, so you are clearly both at odds of what the court is saying. Let's talk about the way forward. The SABC at some point had said that it was not going to oppose the application to the High Court to have the Public Protector's Report on review. Are you now going to challenge that? That's the position of the SABC. One was not informed by a view that the public protector's uh, finding and remedial actions was at odds with the position of the corporation. It was purely on the basis that this was a report of the public protector which the corporation had agreed with. And uh, to save costs, the SABC considered it unnecessary to enter that frame. It was only at the time that the SABC was informed that the public protest again, due to the financial constraints, would not be opposing the application, that the SABC took a conscious decision to oppose that application. All right, thank you very much for speaking to us. SABC advocate Ntutuzelo Vanara, and uh, that brings us to the end of this hour. So coming up in the next hour, we talk to water policy strategist Professor Anthony Churchin and Agri-SA Executive Director Christo van der Rieda on the drought to the state of the country's dams and what it means for the current planting season. Do stay with us. <laughs> Thank you.
Economics Unbound is not primarily a collection of facts to be memorized. Instead, economics is better thought of as a collection of questions to be answered or puzzles to be worked out. When you look at our economic outlook, what is it that we need which will take us there? And I don't see any other career except education. Every major problem facing the world today, from global warming to world poverty, as well as the COVID-19 pandemic, has an economic dimension. The principles are very clear. You, you, you want to create an economy that gives, delivers more jobs, that has greater equality, that is greener. A basic understanding with the concept makes you a well-rounded thinker. If you haven't been bitten by the economics bug, there are other reasons why you should watch Economics Unbound every Thursday at 9 p.m. In this tough COVID-19 times, the nation looking to government for solutions. But the fight against the pandemic has been plagued by widespread corruption. The lives of frontline workers put at risk and citizens denied of much needed aid and personal protective equipment. The president assured the nation that he would deal with corruption decisively. Will there be any action against the corrupt or will it be business as usual? Watch SABC News for ongoing coverage on COVID-19 corruption. SABC News, independent, impartial. Welcome, you're watching The Full View here on SABC News Channel. Thank you so much for joining us at the second hour. We continue to take your feedback on what do you think uh, happened on the uh, fleeing of the Bushiris from South Africa to Malawi. We're asking you who should be held accountable more on this discussion. And uh, also we're talking a drought of the South. Let's go straight to those uh, top stories. The Hawks investigating how enlightened Christian gathering church leader Shepard Bushiri and his wife managed to flee to Malawi. A woman fighting for her life in hospital in a horrific case of gender-based violence that claimed the lives of her two young children. And the late Deputy Speaker of the KwaZulu-Natal Legislature and the ANC leader Mlule Gindobe is laid to rest question of the day is about the Bushiris uh, fleeing South Africa uh, saying that their lives are in danger appealing to the South African government uh, to uh, protect them saying that they also hope that the government will commit to not withdrawing the bail as, as a result of this obviously they've breached the bail conditions they were supposed to report to the police station local police station every Monday and a Friday the Hawks now say uh, they didn't realize until Friday when they missed that appointment. Who should be held accountable? We're asking you. While dam levels have seen a slight increase this week, the dam stood at 29.9% uh, last week, but has risen to 30.2 percent while restrictions don't seem to be on the cards the lower levels are taking their toll however prospects for rain and normal dam levels are encouraging dr anthony turton is water policy strategist and christopher van der rieda is agri sa executive director very good evening to you both um, dr turton let me just start with you under normal or under such circumstances obviously which aren't normal given uh, climate change etc we have seen some rains i did mention that restrictions don't seem to be on the card but what would be uh, the next line of action from a policy perspective at this point to preserve water yes uh, good evening to you and the listeners um 
I'm glad you mentioned the policy story because the reality is that in uh, in 2002, South Africa transitioned to a fundamentally water constrained economy when National Water Source Strategy 1 determined that we'd allocated uh, 98% of all the water we have to existing lawful uses. Um, so what we really should be doing from a policy perspective is starting to create new water, which is uh, about recovering water from waste and desalinating water from the ocean. This is not yet considered as a serious policy option. And as a result of that, we haven't really uh, had a policy-driven response. However, having said that, the, uh, the, 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 the dam levels at the moment are reasonable, with the exception of some isolated areas, Eastern Cape for one, Vile River for another, and parts of KZN uh, seem to be a bit low at the moment. But in general, we, we, we seem not to be too bad at the moment. Mm. Although I notice that there are localised areas that, that, that are having problems. And do we have the capacity, the resources to produce those new sources of water that you've mentioned? Yes, South African technology uh, partners are, have been world leaders until recently. And uh, we certainly don't have any shortage of capital that's willing to flow into the water sector. The problem is the water sector is in such a st state of distress at the moment. Uh, it is unbankable uh, for, for various corruption related reasons. And this is why we need to have a, uh, an independent water regulator. But there's no shortage of capital that's willing to come into the sector. And there's also no shortage of technology that's willing to come in. Really what we need is a policy response uh, to, to uh, uh, you know, give us some kind of policy direction. And that is why we've created the Safian Water Chamber uh, to engage with government on this very important issue. Now, AgriSA producing a report, uh, Mr. Fenrieda, that showed that I think seven of the country's nine provinces are in distress. Um, I think 70% of your group's uh, 18,000 farmer base had been affected. Indeed. Uh, I think, um, let me f uh, quickly uh, go back a few years ago. Remember 2016, 2017, we had a serious, serious drought situation in the country. So much so that uh, the Western Cape uh, faced almost uh, day zero. But uh, since then, uh, I think we have recovered uh, uh, quite uh, uh, significantly. Uh, we have seen very, very good uh, rains in the Western Cape uh, during the past winter season. Their dam dams are full at this point in time. They've lifted the restrictions. Um, at the same time, we uh, have seen good rains in the summer rainfall areas, and we, uh, there's a prediction that the uh, good rains will continue. But we cannot rest on our laurels because we have seen in the past, and we went through the various cycles. Uh, one moment you've got the drought spelled, and the next moment there's good rains. And that's why we need to do proper water planning. That's the big issue in this country. Uh, we, have, we have seen our farmers have adapted, uh, and that for me is a, a very, very good thing that farmers um, uh, know how to uh, adapt, uh, you know, and they've applied very good strategies to uh, overcome the challenges that climate change throw at them. But we need planning, planning, working together, collaboration, because ultimately farmers are responsible for producing food. And farmers have been the saving grace of this country for the past few months. But we need cooperation from government side wow. and experts like Dr. Turton and so forth mm. so that we can produce food for this country. Let's talk about government. Uh, I think the finance ministry gave the industry 50 million rand earlier this year. The Department of Water and Sanitation, another 300 million rand. Has that been, um, well, we won't say enough, but has that been helpful in drought relief efforts? Uh, you know, th that's, that in itself is a very big challenge. Many of our commercial farmers still wait for assistance and many of our small-scale farmers haven't received the necessary assistance. Somewhere between Treasury, national government and provincial governments, things happen that are really not in the interest of the agriculture sector. And uh, we've questioned the minister about that and hopefully, uh, and even uh, the role that COCTA was supposed to play in uh, sinking balls, none of these things have really happened. And that for us is a big concern. Mm. 
Dr. Tote, management of uh, water resources has been a major issue in, in this country. I mean, if you look at the amount of water wastage as a result of um, leaks that municipalities are not attending to, etc., um, where is the problem? Old infrastructure that is also exacerbating the ability to at least preserve water. Yes, um, it's a complex issue, and I'll try and simplify it as, as, as best I can. Uh, yes, uh, clearly uh, we have got uh, damaged infrastructure. Uh, every city in the world has got old infrastructure. New York City right now is dealing with exactly the same issue of, of old infrastructure. So that's not a, not a unique thing to South Africa. It comes down to planning. Um, you know, we need to plan on a 20-year cycle. If you, for example, make a decision tomorrow to build a dam somewhere, it, uh, it takes at least 10 to 20 years uh, from the decision to actually build that dam. And the reality is that there's very, very few dam sites left in South Africa because we've harvested all of the rainfall that we can. So, you know, the bottom line is that we need... Sorry? So... There is, I believe, a 900 billion rand investment shortfall with regards to water resources, uh, Dr. Turton. Where should the money come from? Should we be better prioritizing? Well, that's a very, very good question. A 900 billion rand shortfall is not a trivial sum of money. Uh, private sector is willing to consider going into that space. However, private sector needs conditions that are conducive to the investment of that money, and part of that is, is policy certainty. So if government is willing to give policy certainty, and this is what the, uh, what the uh, SA Business Water Chamber is about, trying to engage the government about getting that policy certainty, then we can start raising that sort of money. Because uh, I, you know, there's no way that the taxpayer can afford that, and the fiscus is running dry at the moment. Uh, we're approaching a fiscal cliff in the very near future. So, so none of that money will come from from the fiscus, but it will come from the private sector on condition that uh, the, 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 there's a renegotiation between the state and the private sector mm. on the terms and conditions, because there will always be terms and conditions applied. Mr. van der Rieder, what can the farming community do? You mentioned earlier on that there is a need to uh, pass down very much necessary skills uh, to uh, not only farmers, but those within the farming community, live around farming communities. What else can be done? What Dr. Uh, 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 has said is that if you allow the private sector to do what they do best, the end result speaks for itself. And we've seen uh, during the past few months, we have had very, very good export seasons. The citrus farmers have exported to the Asian countries. We've seen a very, very good um, uh, maize harvest. Um, and we've had a very good table grape season. And all over the country, they, uh, the, the agriculture sector has contributed significantly to economic growth. Why is that? Because if uh, you empower farmers and you give farmers the necessary space in which they can function, they can operate, then they will do what they do best. I have never seen a politician or a government producing food for the people. That is something that farmers are good at. Hmm. And um, it's critical that um, you, know, you need, uh, and, and I agree, you need policy certainty you need um, investment, continuous investment. We've seen the land bank facing serious financial challenges, and that will have an impact, significant impact. But the sad thing is, to... when it comes to certainty, that's something government uh, uh, was not able to do this year. It's been a global problem. It's been out of their hands. The issue of COVID-19 exports uh, have been deeply impacted because of that. So uh, surely there must be a safety net within the farming community that they can build themselves. But as a community, as a South African community that we'd have to work with outside of those certainties, because as we've seen, COVID-19 way beyond our control. No, indeed. But uh, remember now, COVID is but one issue that has impacted on the entire economy. Uh, the uh, agriculture sector was uh, in a very favorable position as it was declared an essential service. But uh, you need policy certainty for farmers to reinvest. Farmers cannot take their money out of the country and go invest it uh, on somebody else's land. Their land is in South Africa. But if you have issues like uh, 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 you know, 
whether it's expropriation without compensation or whether it's nationalization of land, any person, any rightful business thinking person will not really invest because of that uncertainty. And in addition to that, we need to make more liquidity available to the market. And that's where Land Bank plays a critical role. Obviously, your other commercial banks as well. But financing is critical. You can dish out land left, right and center. But if there's no money for production loans on an annual basis, then that entire uh, 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 farm will come to a standstill. So that's what I refer to when I talk about certainty. Mm. Uh, and Dr. Tertian, I want to talk about the wetlands. It says that 33% of the remaining ones are already critically endangered. Uh, what policy um, innovations are in place to be able to tackle this? Yes, uh, wetlands are hugely important in, uh, in any arid country like South Africa. And I'll give you an example now uh, from Australia, the, uh, the city of Melbourne in Australia. Uh, is very similar to Cape Town, same kind of rainfall conditions, growing population base, same agricultural base uh, as, as, as Cape Town. And what they've done is they've made a decision driven by policy to go into the desalination of seawater. Now, immediately the people say, oh, desalination is a bad thing. But what's now happening, because of the desalination policy, they have now been able to keep water levels in the dams higher, and therefore they've actually rehabilitated the wetlands. So, you, so, so when you're living in a modern world, when the human population is basically uh, uh, outstripped its available uh, uh, freshwater supplies, we have to start using technology in order to rehabilitate things like wetlands. So this is something that we're going to have to think of very, very uh, seriously in the near future. And another thing is going to have to be uh, the, the recovery of water from waste and then the storage of that water underground in aquifers rather than in dams, because under conditions of climate change, where we're losing huge volumes of water to evaporation, uh, the Australians have also made a move in that direction uh, where they, they, they practice a significant managed aquifer recharge. Uh, the, the city of Perth, for example, recovers 120 megalitres a day, 120 million litres of water a day from sewage uh, recharged into the ground, banked for 20 years into the future. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anthony Churchin, Water Policy Strategist, and to you, uh, Krista van der Rieder, Agri-SA Executive Director. In the next hour, we speak to self-proclaimed prophet Shepherd Bushiri from Malawi, where he says he and his wife Mary are temporarily relocated due to safety and security concerns. The Hawks call him a fugitive who has absconded in violation of his bail conditions. He uh, obviously sees it differently and is asking the uh, South African government to not revoke his uh, bail. The Two Oceans Aquarium 